This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. One of the more frequent questions we get calls about our patients go back on dialysis with a failed graft. And the question is, what should I do with the immunosuppression? Which of the drugs should we stop? Can we stop them all? Should we remove the kidneys? So Alison Weber is going to shed light on this whole a challenging area of managing the patient with a failed graft who goes back on dialysis. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, as Flavio said, I think this is a, a very good topic. It's, it's something that we are faced with. We get these questions all the time. My patient is a failed allograft. They're back on dialysis. Do I keep them on immunosuppression? Are there benefits to keeping them on immunosuppression when they have a failed allograft? Do I start to wean? What are the pros and cons of each of these um, ways to address the situation? So I'll give you a little bit of background. About 5,000 patients annually, which is 4 to 5% of the incident dialysis population, are returning to dialysis after renal allograft failure. And only 15 to 16% of those patients receive another kidney transplant within a year. Patients with a failed allograft have a 42% survival rate compared with 75% of those with a functioning graft over a 10-year period. That's not surprising. What is surprising is that mortality for transplant failure patients on dialysis is twice as high compared with the risk for transplant naive patients on dialysis. What are some theories behind that? Why would it be that patients with a failed allograft back on dialysis do worse with patients who are transplant naive on dialysis? Obviously, the infectious complications from the immunosuppression is um, one of the reasons why perhaps these patients um, have worse mortality, not just necessarily remaining on immunosuppression, but the lifelong exposure to immunosuppression. Um, there's also this idea of this endothelial dysfunction. So um, when you have a failed allograft, um, there's an alloimmune response that happens in an, obviously in an inflammatory milieu or environment, which is associated with, has been found to be associated with elevated cholesterol levels, high CRP levels, reduced serum albumin. Um, and this has been found to show uh, reduced coronary artery flow rates. And the hypothesis is then that would be a precursor for cardiovascular events. So when you have a failed allograft, in this, with a chronic inflammatory response, it could potentially lead to increased cardiovascular events, making them higher risk for mortality on dialysis compared to a transplant naive patient. What are the options? So what can we do? We can continue full immunosuppression on these patients. We can taper or stop immunosuppression altogether once they go back on dialysis. And we can also consider removing the transplant. So what about continuation of immunosuppression after a failed transplant? So what are the potential benefits? Why would you expose somebody to immunosuppression? How can they benefit from remaining on immunosuppression after being back on dialysis? Well, there's the idea of preservation of residual kidney function. And I'll go into a little bit more about that, but as we all know in non-transplant patients, um, patients with um, preserved renal function with urine output um, uh, on dialysis do better uh, from a mortality perspective than those who have no residual renal function. Does that apply to patients with residual kidney function from their allograft? Um, so that might be a potential benefit if you're maintaining that renal function, maintaining urine output. What about um, uh, this decreased incidence of graft intolerance syndrome, which is with the syndrome I just mentioned before. This inflammatory environment which leads to markers that are associated with cardiovascular events. Um, that might be, that will be mitigated if you maintain immunosuppression in these patients. Um, and then minimization of allosensitization, um, where um, obviously if you, or it's, it's known that if you withdraw immunosuppression, and I'll go over the studies, that these patients will develop increased levels of HLA antibodies and become sensitized, whereas you may avoid that if you maintain them on immunosuppression when they go back on dialysis. 
Potential adverse um, effects, of course, the metabolic complications. We all know that our medications, steroids, of course, calcineurin inhibitors, they're associated with metabolic complications like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Clearly, they're linked to increased cardiovascular events and um, also causing uh, potentially uh, adverse events. Steroid-associated adverse events, we all know very well, diabetes, cataracts, myopathy, avascular necrosis, cardiovascular complications, increased susceptibility to infection and malignancy. As we saw in Dr. Fang's talk, there are clearly malignancies that are associated with immunosuppression. Several of them are viral-mediated or infection-mediated malignancies, so that would be a, a potential adverse effect of maintaining these patients. Um, so let's go over preservation of residual kidney function. We, as I said before, in non-transplant settings, PD and HD patients with preserved kidney function have better survival rates compared with their oliguric or aneuric counterparts. Is there any data to, to, to looking at the kidney transplant population and residual kidney function or urine output in the kidney transplant population? And the answer is no. There is no direct data on survival benefit of maintaining residual renal function in patients with a failed transplant. There was a decision analytic model that looked at this question, and that model compared continuation of immunosuppression with withdrawal in patients in a theoretical cohort uh, returning to PD. And in that, with that theoretical cohort in this model, it did show a survival benefit of maintaining renal function um, in a patient returning to PD of 5.8 years versus 5.3 years, respectively. There were two assumptions that were made with this theoretical cohort. The first assumption is that the beneficial effects of residual graft function are similar to native kidneys. We don't know that for sure. And two, that the risk of carcinoma, other malignancies, and opportunistic infections was the same as in the general population if immunosuppression was withdrawn. So what about the benefits of maintaining immunosuppression in terms of minimization of allosensitization? So meaning the development of HLA antibodies and a high CPRA um, uh, if you are weaned off of immunosuppression. So this is a study that was published in Transplantation that basically, uh, as the title suggests, found that independent of nephrectomy, weaning of immunosuppression leads to late sensitization after kidney transplant failure. This was a retrospective analysis. There were 119 unsensitized patients who had kidney transplant failure between January 98 and December 2009. Weaning of immunosuppression, which was defined as elimination of all immunosuppression therapy by 120 days after failure. 95 patients were weaned in this retrospective analysis. 39 of those patients underwent allograft nephrectomy. And late PR PRA testing, which was defined as six to 24 months after failure, data was available for all of these patients. So this is looking at variables which were associated with the risk of becoming highly sensitized. And as you can see, when you look at this table, weaning immunosuppression in the univariate model was statistically significantly associated with becoming highly sensitized at the parameters that were um, designated in the study, and the same held true for transplant nephrectomy. But on the multivariate model, um, weaning immunosuppression withstood that model in clearly being a variable that was associated with it becoming highly sensitized, and transplant nephrectomy actually did not maintain that in the absence of weaning immunosuppression. So it's very clear that weaning immunosuppression by itself um, will lead to the late development of HLA antibodies and um, uh, lead that patient to becoming highly sensitized. So what about retransplantation and survival? So this is looking at, at the same study, comparing patients who were maintained or weaned uh, uh, off of immunosuppression after the failure, and, it, and it, it clearly showed a trend for a higher rate of retransplantation, 46% versus 29%, and a shorter time for relisting to retransplantation, median 17 versus 36 months in those who were maintained on immunosuppression. The mortality rate was similar between the groups. There was a 33% mortality rate and a median of 33 months after failure in patients on immunosuppression, and a 25% rate and a median of 39 months in patients who were weaned off of immunosuppression. Um, most deaths occurred in patients who were on dialysis, and those retransplanted which showed a lower mortality rate um, 
Um, two malignancy-related deaths were in the maintenance, immunosuppression maintenance group, one with a melanoma, one with a CNS lymphoma, and most deaths in the withdrawal group were related to cardiac arrest or sudden death in a sensitized patient on the wait list. So the conclusions of this study was that high levels of antibody sensitization were common at six to 24 months after kidney transplant failure. Sensitization rates increased markedly from the time of failure in patients who were weaned off of immunosuppression. Weaning of immunosuppression was an independent risk factor for both class one and class two PRA elevation after controlling for transplant nephrectomy, HLA matching, and other risk factors for sensitization. Many patients with failed transplants remain on the wait list with a high PRA that developed only after returning to dialysis therapy. We need new strategies to avoid late rejection and sensitization after kidney allograft failure. So those would be some, potentially some of the benefits of maintaining people on immunosuppression, maintaining, you know, with the minimal data there is, perhaps maintaining some renal function and preventing allosensitization. So what about the adverse effects of continuation of immunosuppression? This is an article that was published and it looked at fever infection and rejection after kidney transplant failure. It looked at 186 patients with failed kidney transplants and they looked for its, their, those patients' rate of hospitalization with fever within six months after their allograft failed. So 121 of those patients were hospitalized and out of those that were hospitalized, 82 of them were hospitalized for fever. So what you can see is they looked at whether those, that fever was found to be associated with an infection or not associated with an infection. And they found that those patients that had weaned um, off of immunosuppression um, uh, were higher, had a higher incidence of um, no infection. And those patients who are maintained on immunosuppression, their fever ultimately resulted in a higher incidence of infection. So what were the infections that were common in patients who were maintained on immunosuppression? Venous catheter bloodstream infections, urosepsis, pneumonia, C. diff, and peritonitis. And interestingly, when it looked at the demographics and rates of hospitalization in patients who survived versus those who ultimately died within 12 months of allograft failure, those who were hospitalized with a documented infection had a statistically significant higher mortality than those who were hospitalized with fever that were not found to have an infection. So the conclusions of this paper were maintaining patients with failed allografts on immunosuppression led to greater rates of hospitalizations with infection, which was associated with a higher early mortality rate post allograft failure. Clearly, um, infection is um, a clear risk of patients who are back on dialysis and are being maintained on immunosuppression. Well, again, as, um, again, once again, what Dr. Fang had mentioned, there are certainly cancers that we know that are more associated with patients, transplant patients on immunosuppression, virally mediated um, Kaposi sarcoma, for example, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, HPV-associated cancers, and, this, uh, and these were also found in an Australian and New Zealand dialysis and transplant registry showed that the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma decreased markedly upon cessation of immunosuppression in transplant patients once their allograft failed, so, um, that which makes sense. Okay, so what about transplant nephrectomy? When should we, what are the indications for transplant nephrectomy? What are the risks and benefits of transplant nephrectomy? Um, so here's just a list, um, briefly. Um, potential benefits of taking the kidney out. A failing graft is a focus of a chronic inflammatory state. I've said that multiple times in this talk. Um, uh, and, um, it, and therefore, it may reduce mortality rates if you remove the source of this chronic inflammatory state, which may, may be linked to um, cardiovascular uh, events and other, other things as well. Um, what are some of the downsides? There is the risk of allosensitization, even though um, it was seen in that last study that I showed you that's, that weaning immunosuppression by itself leads to allosensitization. There is data to suggest that transplant nephrectomy itself does also lead to um, a rebound of antibodies in the serum and allosensitization as well. What are some absolute and relative indications for transplant nephrectomy? 
absolute indications. These are commonly accepted. If a patient doesn't, if a kidney never works and the patient is experiencing primary non-function, it's an absolute indication for removal. Hyperacute rejection, an absolute indication for removal. Um, arterial or venous thrombosis, these are some of the things that are absolute indications for removal, and this graft intolerance syndrome, recurrent urinary tract infections, which is where the source is thought to be the kidney transplant. Obviously, with a failed kidney transplant, you would remove that. Um, and then there are some relative indications, um, which are the presence of hematologic or biochemical markers of the chronic inflammatory state, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So in this study, it looked at the presence of a failed kidney transplant in patients who are on hemodialysis is associated with chronic inflammatory state and erythropoietin resistance. So they looked at um, different groups of patients. In group A, these were 43 patients returning to dialysis after allograft failure. In a subdivision of group A, labeled group A1, 29 of those patients had symptoms of this chronic inflammatory state. And in A2, 14 had no symptoms. And then group B was a group of 121 incident HD patients, no history of transplantation. And what you could see is, when you look at this erythropoietin resistance, resistance index, or this ERI, so baseline, baseline group A1, um, with symptoms, once they removed the kidney, you can see that this erythropoietin resistance, resistive index uh, improved dramatically. Similarly, the albumin levels went up post-nephrectomy, as well as the CRP levels went down post-nephrectomy. So this is evidence that EPO resistance and other things that are associated with this chronic inflammatory state are real and do actually improve post-transplant nephrectomy. Um, some studies show that a transplant nephrectomy conveyed a lower relative risk for all cause mortality. Others showed increased mortality post-transplant nephrectomy among those with early graft loss, so graft survival less than 12 months, um, uh, but there was a decreased mortality among those with late graft loss, or greater than 12 months, with a hazard ratio of 0.89. So what are some adverse effects of transplant nephrectomy? Of course, there's a surgery, so there's morbidity and mortality associated with the surgical procedure. I mean, different quotes of the morbidity and mortality uh, are throughout multiple studies, but anywhere between 17% and 16%, a 60% morbidity, mortality ranging from 1.5 to 14%. This wide variation was due to timing of surgery, the indication, patient's condition at the time, surgical technique, and of course, the individual center's practice. Um, there is ample literature, as I showed before, that a transplant nephrectomy, that one of the adverse effects of a transplant nephrectomy might lead to an increase in this class one or class two PRA, um, and that this kidney is ultimately kind of acting as a sponge for these antibodies, that when you remove the sponge, the antibody levels in the blood rise. And what about the effects of transplant nephrectomy on repeat transplant outcomes? Um, they vary. Studies exist uh, indicating an adverse impact of transplant nephrectomy on clinical outcomes of a repeat transplant. Wait times due to high PRA, which would make sense. Some studies show higher DGF, more graft failure, more rejection rates. Other studies show the neutral effect on outcomes for retransplant. Um, and some, as mentioned before, show increased mortality. Some, some, some show improved mortality. They're very variable. One question that sometimes comes up is, what is the role of transplant nephrectomy if somebody loses their graft from BK? And there's a study that was done, also published in Transplantation, um, that it, transplant nephrectomy did not affect uh, the recurrence of BK in a, in a second transplant, but viremia clearance did. So our protocol is now that the BK must be cleared from the blood before going forward with another transplant. So what would be the suggested algorithm for management of these patients? Um, and I think what um, most of the studies show and what, uh, what makes the most sense is it has to be uh, patient dependent. Um, so we have, this is one algorithm that's been suggested by the folks who wrote this paper. There's allograft failure, the patient returns to dialysis. Um, if obviously, if they're not on dialysis, you would continue low-dose immunosuppression. If they return to dialysis and they are, have a live donor, or they're, they're, it's likely that they will get transplanted soon, 
um, you would, might want to consider continuing immunosuppression to prevent that allosensitization um, and to make it more likely for them to get a transplant. If they don't have a live donor and they have adequate urine output, um, you might want to you might want to consider that that urine output may benefit that patient, um, but if they're a high complication risk, meaning has that patient had a very complex course with multiple infections and skin cancers and other things, if they're high complication risk, you're not going to want to maintain that immunosuppression to maintain the urine output. If they are low complication risk with low evidence of over immunosuppression. Um, you can continue um, potentially the immunosuppression, um, or I'm sorry, uh, weaning. Um, so that's a suggested algorithm. Um, some of the ways that we that we do things is actually pretty consistent with what this paper suggests. Um, uh, typically, when you decide that this patient is a um, has is not really uh, uh, has a chance of getting transplanted soon, of course, there is a little bit of a um, issue because the new allocation system, of course, now does give priority to highly sensitized patients. So, are, is that really a disadvantaged group? Um, I think overall it's still considered a disadvantaged group, but given the new allocation system, these patients are certainly getting transplanted. Um, but still, um, some of the suggestion, uh, suggested immunosuppressive withdrawal protocols um, is that once they start dialysis, um, oftentimes we'll discontinue the anti-metabolite, uh, we'll taper the CNI, um, you may want to maintain the same steroid dose, um, and then taper very slowly over a prolonged period of time. That's typically um, how we, we uh, do tapering at UCSF. In conclusion, each management decision regarding patients with a failed kidney transplant has its own risks and benefits. Decisions regarding immunosuppression weaning versus maintenance and transplant nephrectomy versus no nephrectomy need to be made on an individual basis, weighing the likelihood and timing of retransplantation, symptoms of graft intolerance syndrome, and rejection of the risk of infection and malignancy. Thank you. Oh, it was just so clear. Oh, okay. Can you, can you distinguish between the relative impact of the three different drugs, like anti-metabolite, CNI, mm. and prednisone, on the antibody levels? On the? Eventual titers. Oh, eventual maybe. titers. That's a great question. Um, and I don't know of any studies that have looked at specifically the actual regimens or which medication being withdrawn is most highly associated with the rebound of antibodies because the studies that I showed you here were basically weaning meant almost off all immunosuppression, basically. So it would, be, would have been very interesting if, if that study had looked at, okay, let's wean off the Celsept, check a PRA at that point. Let's wean off the calcineurins, check a PRA at that point. Um, but I don't know of any studies that look specifically at that. But that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Suppression, like atypical mycobacterium and C CMV, you know, late on. And these are the things that we sometimes see in practice and we assume are related to continuing immunosuppression. I mean, they certainly are related to continuing immunosuppression for sure, and we always want to look for those in patients who are on immunosuppression. But with transplant patients, the most common infections are still the most common infections that are in the community. And that's why I think in this study with, with, with just basically about uh, not a huge amount of follow-up, um, they, they presented with the, the most common types of infections. But you're absolutely right. When, when we have a patient maintained on immunosuppression, we are going to look for the nocardias, the mycobacteriums, um, and uh, the CMVs for sure. But it's a good point. I have a similar question. What make you decide? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what make you decide to remove anti-metabolite first instead of removing the calcineurin inhibitor first? Absolutely nothing. It's just based. Uh, every center does different things, actually. And they actually looked at a survey recently where they looked at different centers and they surveyed what are your practices because this is a very unclear. Um, thing to do, and some centers started by weaning the CNI, some centers, majority actually started with the MMF, um, but it's not because there's any clear data suggesting one weaning is better than another. What is the role, if any, in uh, transplant ultrasound in, in uh, evaluation for transplant nephrectomy? The radiologists have this mm. complicated grading system, so right. when they give these detailed reports, is that just completely meaningless? 
I mean, I think that for the most part, we don't necessarily we, we, we don't necessarily look at the ultrasound and, and find something in the ultrasound that says, okay, this kidney needs to come out. We look at the syndrome. Are they having hematuria? Are they having fevers? Are they having pain? Are they having what looks like this in chronic inflammatory state in the setting of what looks like a highly inflamed kidney? And that would be something. But we would not, if they were in the absence of any of those signs or symptoms, findings on an ultrasound by itself is not an indication for a transplant nephrectomy. Thank you.